Joining from Matt Barnes, the nutritionist with Matt Barnes, Scott Ziesler. Um I'm talking about ulcers, but honestly, my background is uh, more strictly nutrition than health vitamins. And feeding, I think it's thrown into more of the digestive health side of things. Uh, as of late, I guess, with ulcers being a big issue, I did uh, stay for quite a few years uh, with Alltech, actually, um, being a digestive health expert for them and a variety of species. Anyhow, so. Today we're going to talk about ulcers in horses. Are you good to go here? Yep, you're good to go. Uh, otherwise known as equine gastric ulcer syndrome. Uh, and so we're just going to look at uh, what it is, I guess, first of all, the prevalence of it, cause risk factors to it, uh, symptoms, diagnosis, management, and then a little bit on treatment as well. So we just, now it's kind of been covered, so the whole digestive system, but what is EGAS? It's essentially ulcers up in the non. It can be anywhere in the stomach, actually, and it can be in the hind gut. You can have it in the small intestine. It's, very, it's a lot more rare to have lesions in there. The most common place to see it is the non glandular region, and that is from excessive exposure to acid. As Alex talked about it. Horses are chronic secretors of uh, hydrochloric acid or acid in the stomach, and if the stomach's sitting empty, it's not buffered properly, the acid gets up the non glandular region, causes lesions, and then you get ulcers. There is some implication in bacteria as well, but in horses, typically it's just acid. The prevalence of ulcers in racehorses, you can pretty much put it at 100% thoroughbreds. There is breed differences for sure. Standard breds do show high rates of ulceration, but not nearly as severe as thoroughbreds. If you do uh, endoscopic evaluation, thoroughbreds a lot of times looks like somebody threw a grenade in there. Standard breds tend to be smaller lesions. I'll show you some videos after. Other performance horses, so whether it be barrel racing, showing, uh, jumping, things like that, it's still a very high incidence, and we'll get to the reason that is. Foals, again, they have a high incidence a lot of times because we're keeping them in stalls. Um, and younger horses are more susceptible to ulcers than older horses are. Okay, causes risk factors. Uh, Alex, again, we talked about this. Continuous secretion of acid from the stomach. So in humans, you pretty much shut your acid production down when you're not eating. Humans are more built to eat larger meals, not continuously eat. So when we eat, it's a signal to the brain to produce acid. Horses, they continuously produce it. So if at any time they're not uh, eating or having food going in there, you still have acid production going on. And that is the most common cause. In humans, really the only cause of ulcers is from the Heliobacter uh, pylori. Uh, it's not so much getting acid splashed up. Uh, and horses in the wild do not get ulcers. So what's that bring us to cause and risk factors? Ulcers is essentially a management issue. How we maintain our horses now versus them being in the wild, running as a social group. And social group and social behavior and eating is a big thing. So lack of grazing time, not having horses out. But one thing with the social aspect of horses is, even if you do have your horses out all the time and you move them around in groups and you had a horse that was maybe in the top third of the pecking order and all of a sudden they get knocked right down at the bottom, that is a serious stress for the horse. And you'll see horses like that, even though they're in the ideal environment, start to develop ulcers, symptoms of ulcers, and simply just because you move them between social groups. Inadequate forage, Cindy talked about this, forage intake. And I'll touch on something on the forage side again that I want to add to the nutritional component of ulcers. Exercise, and it's not exercise so much. They talk about you know the contraction and the pressure that gets built up during exercise or running, causing the acid to push up in the non-glandular region. Uh, I'd say it's more, it's the stuff that goes around exercise and how we keep our horses and what we put them through the trailering, keeping them stalls, not enough time outside, constant changes in stress and things like that. Grain feeding's been implicated with ulcers as well. Stall confinement. And stress, trailering, separation, isolation, or feed deprivation. Those are all stressors to the horse. It can all lead to ulcers, which is why we see such a high incidence of cross groups of horses. Okay, so if you want to diagnose ulcers, endoscopic evaluation is the only 100% way to be sure. We're talking about gastric ulcers here. Stick to the endoscope down and have a look and see if there's ulcers there. It's really the only way to be 100% sure. You hear people talking about lots of other ways. You get blood samples back from your bed. They're anemic, well, it has an ulcer. <coughs> Could be, it's unlikely, uh, that is like a hallmark of it. There's no real good correlation between ulcers and anemia. Um, plasma proteins, again, no good correlation between ulcers and the plasma protein levels in horses. Better marker for hydration than it is for ulcers. There is what they call a fecal occult blood test, which they do in humans as well. You just take a piece of paper and throw it in the toilet. It's a good marker for cancer. People should do it as they get older. Uh, it's a very early warning sign to have uh, any blood in the feces. We can use it in horses, and it's good for detecting positives. It has a relatively high accuracy, I think, in the, um, 
in the upper 70s and 80s. So if it comes back positive, there's a good chance your horse has an ulcer. You don't know where it is. It could be in the stomach. It could be in the hind gut. The problem with it is, though, if it comes back negative, it's very poor on the negative. So even if it comes back negative, you can't exclude the fact that your horse might have ulcers. So it's not great from that standpoint. It's more if you want to convince somebody that your horse actually had ulcers, you do it show them a positive. There's a good chance your horse has ulcers. Okay, so we want to manage ulcers. We want to manage the horses not getting ulcers. We want to provide as a natural environment as possible. So again, outside, I mentioned 16 to 18 hours a day a horse should be eating. Grazing, eating, eating small amounts. So you see the advent of slow, uh, slow feeders now, hay nets and things like that. That helps to prolong the feeding time, especially if you have horses that are overweight, <coughs> that you're trying to limit the caloric intake. You want to slow down the feeding so that's spend more time feeding. I think where horses evolve from, they're typically eating like forages about this long, right? They have to cover vast distances and eat small amounts all along the way. So that's what you're trying to, uh, I guess, simulate in any way you keep your horse to avoid ulcers. Increased grazing time, increases saliva production, which is going to be good, put more water through the system. The, although there's not as high bar, bar carbon value in their saliva as there is in ruminants, still putting more in is going to help buffer the stomach. So you want to reduce your grain feeding, particularly the starch levels going in. You overfeed, even like Cindy was talking about performance horses don't need nearly the level of starch we feed them. A lot of times don't need nearly the level of grain we give them. Uh, just improving the hay quality a little bit can go a long ways and improving the caloric balance for a horse. If you must feed grain, decrease the meal size more than three times a day. And again, we already talked about this. Sometimes it's not possible. It was at Woodbine with the thoroughbreds and there was a guy feeding, I think it was six or seven kilos total per day feed and it was being done twice per day and complained about hind gut issues, stomach issues. And we're just like, well, if you just split that out four, that would probably get rid of a lot of your problems. Forget all the supplements or anything else you want to put in there. And he finally did, so then that did improve it. Alternatives to starch, non forage fiber sources, and additional fat, we talked about that, are also good for ulcers. Anything that we're kind of reducing the grain content of a horse's diet generally improves uh, the situation with ulcers, reducing the incidence or the, the probability that we'll have ulcers. Increased forage. Now, not forage is they're the same here either. <clears throat> so, Bermuda grasses compared to alfalfa, Bermuda grasses show a higher incidence of ulcers, but alfalfa has actually been shown to. Uh, in some cases, actually heal ulcers. And again, I'm not a big proponent of alfalfa to horses. I'm one of those guys pushing going towards grass, but a little of it out of alfalfa is okay. Particularly if you have a horse that has ulcers, just make sure it's balanced with the whole diet and we're not getting carried away. What I tend to see is people that feed alfalfa, it's either all or none, you know, like pure stand alfalfa, and it's just alfalfa to the horse all day long, and that's not a great situation for a lot of reasons. Avoid the NSAIDs, we talked about that already. This one in particular, hypertonic electric uh, electrolyte pace. So, you know, Heidi does endurance racing. A lot of people use the tube pace for electrolytes. is a known causative agent for causing ulcers. You basically, you put in a hypertonic solution, it's going to sit right in the stomach. It's going to mass rush of water coming out, cause cellular damage around where the pace sits. So you don't want to use pace when it comes to electrolytes. It's far, they're far too concentrated with salts to put putting in there, and they do just sit there in the clump. So... Stay away from those. And again, in chronic administration of hypertonic electrolyte solutions, the pace are the bigger problem. Okay, so our main main treatment to this point, I guess, for ulcers has been to increase the stomach pH. So if it's the acid splashing up against the non-glandular region that's causing the problem, well, the solution then must be let's increase the pH of the stomach, right? And that's typically be done with two ways, so the proton pump inhibitors, which is omeprazole, or your H2 receptor antagonists which would be cimetidine. So yeah, I think omeprazole is the big one now. You don't see cimetidine nearly as much. Although you still run into people who swear that cimetidine works and omeprazole doesn't for ulcers. They're very effective at raising the pH of the stomach and blocking the acid secretion. But here's the problem with them. Recurrence rate once you stop treating is extremely high. There's a few reasons for that because you when the causative agent for the ulcer is still probably there. All you did was kind of block the thing that was irritating or making it worse. And we have this thing that's called acid rebound. <clears throat> and this is typical of almost any physiological process. If you think about uh, anybody had their arm go to sleep, cut the blood flow off essentially to your arm, and then you get the pins and needles. The pins and needles is a sensation that comes because when you cut the blood flow off, all the vessels dilate in your arm. And so when you 
remove the occlusion from the blood vessel, you have far, far too many capillaries that are wide open because they want blood. And that's what causes that burning sensation in the pins and needles. And then eventually they close back down and the sensation goes back to normal. Because never at any time are all your capillaries in your, anywhere in your body open, right? They're always closing and opening at different uh, rates. Same thing, you block the acid production in the stomach, <coughs> stays blocked, stays blocked, remove what's blocking it, it tends to overshoot for a little bit until it comes back to equilibrium. So then again, we end up with this high recurrence rate when we take horses off, these meprazole, gastroguard, things like that. Same goes for buffering the stomach. So we're gonna use the Tums effect, we're gonna buffer the stomach, we're gonna knock it down, bring the pH up, I guess, buffer the acid out. Well, when we remove it, we get that kind of rebound of acid that comes up. So in a lot of cases, yeah, it helps at the time if we're going into an event because we're buffering the stomach so the horse feels less pain, but afterwards, we're just kind of making the problem worse because we're getting a higher level of acid production afterwards. <clears throat> There's also possible unintended consequences to raising the pH of the stomach. There's a reason the stomach produces acid. The two biggest ones are to kill pathogenic bacteria and viruses before they get into the rest of the small intestine. The other one is to activate enzymes in the digestive process. The big one being pepsinogen, converting it into pepsin to start breaking down proteins. So acid, if you've ever seen, <coughs> you put acid in the milk, it denatures the proteins, causes it to curdle, things like that. That's essentially what's going on in the horse's stomach and then the pepsin's gonna start cleaving off chunks of peptides and amino acids that makes it much easier to digest in the small intestine. Now we always talk about starch hitting the hind gut of the horse and the acidosis and things like that. What we hardly ever talk about is protein hitting the hind gut of a horse. They talk about it all the time in poultry because you get excessive protein getting into the hind gut. We get these odd fermentation patterns going on. So we have this unintended consequence that we raise the pH of the stomach and we're lowering protein digestion. We get excess protein hitting the hind gut we get these odd bacterial fermentations going on that can then just cause problems in the hind gut. So yeah, we helped at the stomach level, but then we just created problems in the hind gut. Okay, and then on to the plethora of supplements boasting efficacy. Almost none have been tested. How many of you out there, how many supplements do you see out there that actually have clinical research trials beside them backing up the evidence? There's not many. The horse world is just inundated. With people like me, people like Rob, <laughs> and I'm saying that specifically, but out selling supplements to fix some problem your horse has, and just you see it all the time going to a place and just throwing supplement on top, of, on top of supplement and add a problem, hoping it fixes it. And then you go through and actually look who's making them or different products and say, okay, well, why is it formulated like this? What's the purpose of these ingredients? Why are they in there? Show me some proof. And there typically is none. So until somebody can do that, I would say stay away from the supplements are cure-alls without it, unless they can prove that it actually works. This is my second big problem with supplement companies, <laughs> is label dressing. So you talk about feed tags and looking at feed tags. Label dressing is one that I think, you see so many companies doing it. So glutamine, and I use this as an example, because it's an easy one. Basically every gut health supplement out there will say it has glutamine, and there's good reason for it. Your gut, the major energy source for the gut, which has an extremely high turnover of cells, is glutamine. Almost all the glutamine consumed in your diet gets used for energy in the gut, for cellular turnover. But here's the thing. It is also the most abundant amino acid in almost every feed stuff. Making up about 5 to 15% depending on the feed stuff of the total amino acids in there. So that means your intake on your average horse for your 500 kilo or 1,000 pound horse is going to be somewhere in the range of 100 to 150 grams per day. The body's also able to synthesize or turn over glutamine. So you have at a rate which approaches about 500 grams per day. So we're getting close to about 600 grams per day, if you want to say between synthesis and intake. And then you go look on the label, something that says we have 500 milligrams to one gram of glutamine we're adding to your diet. It's not doing anything in terms of supplying fuels for the gut. The levels in research, you get in that 510, a little bit higher, do show that it starts to improve uh, gut cellular turnover. And if, as long as it's up there, then I say it's good it's in there. If, just be sure it's not in there for label dressing. Uh, we already talked about buffers and antacids. They do provide temporary relief, but again, a little bit of acid rebound that happens with it. Alfalfa is a good, uh, actually just about every study that looks at alfalfa, you do see an improvement in ulcer scores when you feed a little bit of alfalfa. And I caution, make sure it's balanced in the total diet. Just don't go, my horse has ulcers, I'm gonna put it on 100% alfalfa now. 
Oils, certainly can be beneficial. Just choose the right type, ones that are high in omega-3. Cindy talked about flax. <coughs> flax oil will definitely be up there. Fish oil is a big one, be high in omega-3s and get you some DHA as well. Generally, any inflammatory with omega-3, you want to stay away from things like corn oil, which should be high in omega-6, which actually could make the problem worse. In very general terms, your omega-6 are going to be pro-inflammatory and your omega-3 is going to be anti-inflammatory. Probiotics have been shown to at least appear to promote healing. And I think this may be like if the acid does cause the lesion in the first place, you may get bacteria colonizing in there that don't allow it to heal. And some of these lactobacillus uh, species do inhibit the growth of other bacteria. They actually produce products that inhibit growth of pathogenic bacteria. So there may be that they also help with healing ulcers. Okay, so I just had two videos to show you basically of uh, endoscopic evaluation. This will play. And no. <laughs> oh, here we go. Sorry about the noise. I'm not sure what that is. I'm putting the button down. Here. I have no idea. Stop. Ow. Anyway, it's not getting a little too much. So this horse was actually doesn't, you won't see the ulcer, the red ulcer, but you see the yellow. What type of keratosis? And again, it's the insult and the acid of the on the stomach there. So, so we're just washing around there, we're looking at the non dangerous granular region, and the kind of marble pertains to the field. And I'm actually turning around. You see a lot of ulcers right on that line. Those ulcers are extremely hard to heal. It's just that you've seen a long time to heal. So it depends on where the ulcer occurs and how long it'll take to heal when you treat it. But you can just see that it's almost like a flat. It's developed on the non and that's from the continuous insult from the acid. And then just to show you, uh, this is in this is a uh, standard bread, but uh, where did the uh, cursor go? Uh oh, there oh, it is. <laughs> Hopefully, this one doesn't have sound. So this is more typically what you see with the red, angry kind of skin. And the non glandular region again it tends to be fairly close to the glandular region where the acid's being produced. And then right there around the esophagus, you can see where the endoscope's coming out. Uh, you see all that kind of red, angry area in there. And again, some hyperkeratosis, which is typical with ulcers. In terms of ulceration, though, that's not bad at all. Like compared to a thoroughbred, the typical thoroughbred, that looks quite good. And here's the other thing when you do these, though, <coughs> some people think the amount of ulceration is basically going to correlate to your, uh, I guess, the severity of the symptoms. It does not at all. What's, what's astonishing, actually, is you'll have a horse like this. It doesn't, or even the one before with hyperkeratosis, no actual open ulceration. So it'll look like it's all sucked up. This is looking terrible, kind of showing signs of colic. You think, like, oh, well, this must be terrible. And you get in there, you're like, well, it's not that bad, actually. And then you go to a thoroughbred, it'll look just fine. And again, it literally looks like somebody threw a hand grenade in there and went off. And the horse, like, if you just stood there and looked at it, you wouldn't think there's anything wrong with it. So the correlation, there is really no correlation between the, uh, the severity of the ulceration and the symptoms that you see. Okay. So this just kind of move on to the hindgut. So the key roles of the uh, microbial population, everybody's kind of talked on this. One of the interesting things you see now, it's coming more from the human side, is the impact of the hindgut or the microbial population on the cognitive function, the mood, and your behavior, and things like that. So you start to think about horses that are hot and different things, and everybody always attributed it to, oh, I'm feeding a hot grain. You can't feed corn because the starch and the milk are supposed to get out of it. I'd actually probably throw that under, throw that away and say that's probably not the case. It's not the glucose that's making the horse hot. It's the disturbance in the hindgut. It's probably upsetting the horse more than anything. So what happens we get the excessive starch, incomplete digestion, or bad blood bugs proliferate. It lowers the pH of the hindgut. So we talked about uh, having a neutral pH in the hindgut. As soon as that pH starts to drop, our good bugs start dying off. Fiber, fiber digestion goes away, and our bad bugs take off. And now we have this problem with acidosis. The acidosis in the hindgut, we get toxins produced, we get things like leaky gut. We don't tend to see as much ulceration 
from the hind gut as you do like the leaky gut. I had some good pictures from cows actually. I should have brought them with me of the rumen papilla actually sloughing off during acidosis. The same thing will happen in the hind gut of a horse if it's continually in an acidic environment. Oh, and that leads to the wonderful world of colic, laminitis, and digestive upset. So just back to the point here about grains and digestion and where they get digested. Cindy so touched on a little bit about processing grains, and that has a huge impact, but also the grain type that we use. And I know this is a little tough to read, but it goes oats, barley, maize, which is corn. And what we're looking at it basically is what gets digested before the cecum. So the small intestinal intestine digestibility of the starch. And then when everything that's left over is going to get, it's looking at total tract digestibility, but you can assume that's obviously all high gut fermentation. And one of the reasons in oats is such a popular feed for horses, you look at the difference between pre cecal digestibility and total tract, and it's very close, about 95%. So most of the starch gets absorbed in the small intestine. Starch in oats is very, very digestible to horses. We move down here to corn, and this is old data. I would argue now that's probably worse than this. But you have 30 some odd percent of it hitting the hind gut. So only about 60 some percent is going to get digested in the small intestine. The rest of it's going to hit the hind gut. So we talked about corn being that hot grain. I don't think it's so much <coughs> that you're getting this excess amount of starch in there. It's just too much if it's reaching the hind gut, particularly if it's not processed very well. Same thing for the protein. And again, you see, as I talked about before, if we're going to raise the pH of the stomach, that's going to inhibit protein digestion in the small intestine. You can already see there's a fair bit that gets to the hindgut without that happening. So when we make that, when we medicate a horse, and then we could possibly make this work, put a lot of extra protein into the hindgut, allowing the proliferation of clostridium. Talked about meal size, and I disagree, actually. I think your meal sizes are way too big in terms of your tolerances. <laughs> if you start looking at one kilo of corn fed per day, and you, this is just fecal acid, basically, total fecal acid. I think it was a half a percent per, for the meal size, right? Yeah. Yeah, so you're about five pounds, right? Two and a half kilos. So that puts you out about here. And you can see how high the fecal acid can start to get at that level. Like as little as one kilo. Now, again, if there's a lot of variation between horses and this, and digestibilities will vary between horses and between breeds. But I would tend to err on the side of caution and make the meal size as small as possible because you can get the acids up quite a bit in the hind gut. Okay, and then I'm gonna wrap it up with that. Wow. <laughs> Does meal size even count if it's something like pickle? Would you say it, that that right? With people, yeah. If it's, it's meal size, yes, it's an issue. If it's green, but what if it's pickle? It's not going to be as important because, and it depends what kind of meat pup you're talking about. It's got molasses and different things in there. Then it starts to make a difference. But if it's the nice non-molasses type, not really. Okay. Now, I say that. So one of the issues with alfalfa and the same bit with beet pulp is the amount of pectin in it. And we, so we're throwing this NFC thing out the window. We're going with NFC and specifically looking at sugars and starches. But then when you look at alfalfa, why is the difference between NFC and NFC so big? It's because of the sheer amount of pectin that's in it, which is indigestible in the small intestine. When that stuff hits the hindgut, it's boom. Like it's just like sugar hitting the hindgut, right? So you can get the same with beet pulp, where you get these uh, very, very soluble carbohydrates. So that would be the only way meal size would be important. But most horses don't eat beet pulp fast enough for it to be Plus a huge the issue. Beet pulp is that beet pulp pellets that still need swampy wet is a huge, uh, multiplies. Yeah, just take some soda, so right. we so eat it, right? Yes, yeah. not really that big of a meal. Okay. Right. So I'd like to make a comment of beet pulp because lots of our feeds have beet pulp in that. But if you're buying a prepared feed, especially if you're buying a, uh, a high fiber feed or a feed that already has, you know, fiber sources in it, whether it's beet pulp or something else, and then you choose to top dress adding it as a raw ingredient, that's a problem. Because most of the feed companies have gone to a lot of trouble to balance the fiber sources, and that's exactly what's got right? So if you're purchasing, I especially say this if you're purchasing a fat and fiber type feed now, or a feed that's already a higher fiber feed, I would caution you to add additional feed pulp to the diet, unless you have a really good reason. And then you should be having, you know, Maggie or Debbie or Alex come in and make sure the rest of your ration is balanced. Any other questions? <laughs>
Oh, okay, want, so at this time, no, I have another yes. question. Oh, sure. Heidi has you another question. <laughs> okay. Um, if you can you heal ulcers by just changing uh, environment uh, and those sorts of things that may have caused that ulcer, and not using any medication? Yeah, one hundred percent. If you take away what the cause is, yeah, they'll resolve themselves in time. And make everything proper. Yeah. In their life, will they resolve? Yeah, it also resolve. Lots of ulcers spontaneous. Like you take a throw of bread, let's mm -hmm. add the racetrack. Mm -hmm. And even as well, if you know, you lay them off for the winter, a lot of them will just resolve on their own right. over time, just being out. Right. Yeah. And as soon as you bring them back to the racetrack, it's like, boom. Usually, as soon as you typically see them when you start training down harder and harder, like yeah. in the racehorses, they start to come back. And I've heard they can develop in like a couple hours. So that actually, <laughs> no, it's a good point because you talk about it when you do endoscopic evaluation. They usually tell you to withhold feed for 12 hours. Well, that hyperkeratosis will start <laughs> yeah. in that time with feed deprivation, right? So, yeah, if you're doing studies particularly and you're scoping horses, I mean, you want the time from feed withdrawal to scope to be pretty close to like across horses, right? Because I mean, I can just set up a study and I just scope them really soon after and just wash the feed out of their stomach. Like, oh, their stomach looks better. Yeah. <laughs> But, and horses with really severe ulcers uh, are often very difficult to scope right. because the gastric emptying starts to get so slow yeah. when oh, they're yeah. like when they're really when they're really off feed type ulcer horses yeah. that don't like that are really struggling with appetite. You go in with a twelve hour off feed and you can't see anything. So you right. say bring it back tomorrow. And that I've had a couple of horses that have had for sure omeprazole failure. Uh, used GastroGuard, the greatest stuff ever. I labeled those and totally didn't work. Send them in for a scope, and usually the first comment from whoever's doing the scope is, "This horse's gastric emptying is really, really slow." You know, you're telling me it's not eating anything, but its stomach is full of feed. I had, you know, I had to have them come back in another 12 hours or another 24 hours before I can get a really good scope. Uh, so, because what makes GastroGuard special? versus compounded omeprazole is the coat of armor that's put around the drug so that it makes it through the stomach acid. Mm -hmm. That's all that's special about gastroderm. And But it's just a coat of armor. So if it spends too much time in the acid, it gets burned off too. So we actually have to double those really severe ulcer courses sometimes with gastroderm. And after you go talk to your banker, <laughs> you yeah, get that line of credit so yeah. you can do it. But they've uh, actually said, who's it? I can't remember her name. Another vet. She was talking about the only even gastric guard getting bile reflux if they're on it too long. Like the people that are chronically on omeprazole or gastric guard, where then that starts to cause problems with the bile back up in the stomach as well. And then, you, then you'll see ulcerations down the glandular portion of the stomach as well. So, yes. Go ahead with your Mad Barn. Oh, I was just going to show that uh, first video <laughs> with the ulcer was, was, this is the same one. <laughs> now, on. It's, it's the second horse, the one in the red one. And actually, where you see where it goes around, coming out of the esophagus there. Well, this is the, after 60 days on treatment. So, this is the product we sell. And actually, I kind of fought tooth and nail. It was a vet clinic that came to me and said, we want to make an ulcer product for, for feeding actually after gastric guard treatment. So stop with the recurrence all the mm -hmm. time. And so this is what we came up with. And you can see around, you remember how angry red it was around that. And again, there is a bit of feed in here. So some of this is time, but it's not all. It, you can see it's pretty much cleaned up completely there. And, and tell us a little bit about what visceral is. So we use visceral strictly for gastric ulcer treatments. It does stuff, stuff to cover off the hindgut as well, but it is for, especially for horses that are on currently on omeprazole, to bring them off and not get the recurrence of the, the ulcer. So the typical treatment would be gastric guard or omeprazole, and then go on the visceral, you have two weeks left, we yeah. down and off to limit the acid rebound, and then you can stay on this as long as the cause of evasion or stressor is still there once you turn your horse out or Get to the point where the stress is removed, or say you're off show season or whatever, you can just take it off because you're probably fine without it. What's the magic ingredient? 
Well, you can start with right. <laughs> no, the, I mean, the ingredients. Or is it, what's that? Is it probiotic-ish or how is it? So it's a whole range of things, and all the ingredients are listed on there. So, I, like, what I like to say is, you know, that a lot of these things you talk about probiotics or lecithin is a big one, glutamine is a big one. It's it's the combination of things. So you want to do a few things. You want to provide the building blocks that are going to allow the stomach to heal, produce more mucin to protect the stomach, get it to produce more, get the rat, get the get the stomach to turn over more, turn the cellular turn over higher, I guess. So that's it's kind of a combination of those things. And there's some herbs in there that have been shown just to got, kind of give you the soothing. It's not necessarily promoting the healing, but helping to soothe the stomach as well. Lecithin is one of the big ones, though. You look at a lot of research on lecithin. And that's actually the, that approached me about was you need a product with lecithin. And I said, yeah, lecithin's good, but you need more than that if you want something that's really going to work. So it's not necessarily a product. I mean, Preventative, really, so much more as to keep that on. They use it as a uh, preventative too. So, lots of guys training horses down, you know, mm -hmm. so you stand really good down at like 220 or something, they'll put them on. Yeah. Throw reds on those. You know, the previous yeah, times they have. The well. Right. Or people going in at show seasons will just put mm -hmm. them on. It, uh, especially if they know they've had problems in the past with the horse. Mm -hmm. Then other people will just get to the point where they protect the deal with the mm -hmm. ulcer issue. We'll do it as preventative. Mm -hmm. It does work well as a preventative. Yeah, you just wouldn't want to. Stuff. I mean, like, if, yeah. ideally, like, why do you want to be right. feeding something like that forever? Right? It's the same thing. It's, it's not that probably. expensive. I mean, compared to gastroguard, it's like you know, I'm an yeah. angel compared to gastroguard. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, even in meprazole treatments, it's still. But again, it's like if you don't need to, why? Yeah. Why do? 